Hello again, everybody. This is Dan Clouser, and welcome back to the Journey of My Mother's Son podcast. Today, I'm joined with Shane Anderson, who is the husband part of the indie folk duo Arbor Season. Shane, thanks for joining me today. I am so excited to be here today. Absolutely. Looking forward to this. One thing I left out of the intro is that Shane is also a fellow nomad uh, traveling throughout the country in his converted schoolie with his wife and family as they go to different gigs. And um, I, I found these guys uh, on Instagram when they did a post about their song Rome, which again, as a nomad just completely spoke to my heart. And I was like, man, these, these are some people I want to connect with and uh, sent them an invitation to be on the show. And they graciously accepted it. And I'm looking forward to this conversation. So before we go any further though, Shane, just introduce yourself in your own words. Who is Shane today? Yeah, so I am, well, I was born in Canada, so I'm Canadian, then moved to the States, and uh, I just love music, I love Jesus, I love my family, my kids are awesome, they're going to be super loud during this podcast, see, there they go, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we just travel full-time playing music, and I would say we do about, man 260 something shows a year so we're playing a lot and that just usually takes up most of my life but um besides that yeah just i think being grateful and and trying to be as joyful as you can is my you know in essence of who i am or try to be i guess yeah i love it i love it so before we get into music because that'll be a a whole deep dive there um tell me a little bit about you know what was the inspiration to start traveling full time? Uh, the inspiration. Sorry, I, I realized if I have to tell my kids to be quiet, I could just push the <laughs> mute button. You guys don't hear it. It's great. Um, I we used to play in Florida all the time. Uh, we played at Disney twice a week for about four years, um, and then we. Uh, I was at a gig once, and this guy showed up in an RV. And he travels the country and fixes stoves and things like that for like uh, restaurants and, you know, he'll ra just random stuff like that. And he was just like this really hippie guy. And I'm this, I just thought he looked really cool. And then we just kind of started talking and he's like, yeah, that's my RV. I'm like, oh, cool, cool. And he's like, yeah, that's my home. I'm like, wait, what do you mean your home? He's like, yeah, I live full time in that RV. And I've never heard of anybody living in an RV full time. So I he gave me a tour. Um, when he lifted up his bed in the back and all his clothes were underneath, I don't know. There's something about that. that I'm like, this is my life. This is what I'm going to do. Um, and that was about nine years ago. And throughout that whole year, I just started researching and I found gone with the winds who are my like top inspiration. Um, now they live in a boat and all that stuff. But I started like just checking out all the things that I, I had a book that just talked about all things RV life. And, um, but it never, it didn't really happen until I met this guy at one of the martini bars we were playing at. And, uh, uh, it's, this is, it's a long story and it's so dumb and I would never encourage anyone to do this, but I met him that night. And then the next day he co-signed for me to get an RV. Um, which is wild. Would never suggest doing that, but we, it worked out perfectly um even though it was a bad idea well we never had any issues we're friends really great friends to this day we paid it off and that's what got us traveling full time and we just loved the idea of just being on the road making vlogs and uh playing shows all over the country is just how we make money and it's also our passion so both of those things intertwine so well and that's that's pretty much the gist of it yeah i love it i love it so when you ran the idea by Emily, um, what was her reaction? Uh, so that's actually a great question because we were a band for three years. Uh, like we were in a duo for three years, but we were only friends. We weren't actually dating. Um, but we actually, when we just started dating, that's when I decided that I wanted to live in an RV. And so we, she had her own apartment. We were, we weren't even living together at this time. And, um, uh, she was like, I mean, I, I mean, uh, we're dating, but if that's what you want to do, 
I mean, go ahead. We're not married yet, so I guess do whatever. It's just a phase, I guess she thought. Um, but she was actually really against it and thought it was a horrible idea. And she laughs about it and talks about it now because um, when we got married, she moved into the RV. She actually was thinking about breaking up with me because she couldn't imagine living in an RV. And then um, after a really long trip with a bunch of friends doing a college tour, playing a bunch of colleges, we came back. I dropped her off at her apartment and she said, well, I missed him too much. And I realized that if I have to marry this guy, it's going to come with living in an RV. And um, so that's what she did. And she became obsessed with the lifestyle um, just as much. If not, there's been a few times when I'm like, look at this house that's for sale. She's like, no, we're living the RV life. And that was it you know so yeah really against it at first fell in love with it after yeah it's funny how you kind of go through that transformation because my my wife was the same when i had uh rolled the idea past her she thought i was completely out of my mind and if you talk to her today she is 100 percent on board we have no plans to you know buy a brick and mortar house anytime soon we are absolutely loving the uh the lifestyle for sure. So, so you started out in a traditional RV. Uh, is that correct? Yeah. So we did a class C RV, um, for like four and a half years, uh, full time. Our kids, they weren't born in the RV, but, uh, they weren't born in the RV, but after they were, you know, we parked the RV at the hospital, gave, <laughs> she gave birth in the hospital and then brought him into the RV and then, yeah, we parked at a friend's house for like for our first kid for like maybe a, like two months, and then we hit the road again. Uh, and then our when we had our daughter, we stayed in, a, in like an apartment for I think two months, three months, uh, a month before she was born, and then two months after. And I just renovated the RV during that. I mean this the school bus during that time because that's that's we had the school bus um, around that time. So yeah, so I even so forgot the question. I'm excited. I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> just just about how you started in an RV and now you you've in into a schoolie. So so you did the conversion mm -hmm. yourself um on the yeah. schoolie. Tell me a little bit about what you know what that process was like. Um, you know, just mm -hmm. putting it all together. It was really crazy because I know there's a lot of people that are probably listening to this and they're like, Man, I really want to get I want to do the school bus conversion or conversion of some sort, but I don't know what I'm doing. And I can't tell you enough how i had no idea what i was doing like <laughs> i've never i don't think i ever even used a drill before like I, man i had no idea what he was doing and the first run through of this bus was actually um not that great and it was kind of ugly and it was only about a year ago maybe even a little less than a year ago i yeah maybe six months ago um i ripped out everything i took out walls i i did everything and then rebuilt the whole entire thing and so I don't know, is this, uh, is this podcast just for hearing or can you see it too? You can see it as well. Yep. But okay, fun. So like how we got it to look like this is, to, uh, you know, was remodeling and ripping things out and doing it again. And now we're super grateful with how it turned out. We just realized there were so many things we wanted to change to fit our lifestyle after living in it for already three years. So we're like, okay, well, we need to change these things. Um, and we didn't want to buy a new bus to start again because, Oh, it was just so crazy. It's a lot of work. And yeah. so, and to go back to the, to the main question is it was just over. I wouldn't, I think for a lot of people it's overwhelming, but my personality is like, I just become obsessed with something until I do it. And I think with all of our shows getting canceled, um, during COVID, uh, I had three months where we just, we had to do something, you know, and since playing music live in front of people is our job, uh, we had a few online shows, but besides that, uh, I had a lot of time to kill. So we drove to Tennessee, picked this bus up off of Facebook Marketplace, and then I just went to work. And I, I think the only thing I YouTubed was how to do plumbing. Um, everything else, I kind of just figured out electric. I talked to a um, an electrician over FaceTime, and he told me what to do. And uh, yeah. Wow, pretty cool. And you were doing this on the heels of having a newborn child too, correct? Do I have that timeline so, right? So, well, actually, so Sawyer was uh, probably two and a half or so when we decided to convert the bus. Um, so, 
yeah, it was, it was, it wasn't that bad. Um, so we parked it at my sister-in-law's house. So Emily and her sister and, and Sawyer, they would all just hang out and have a great time in the house. And I just stayed in the bus and actually we, I, we still lived in the RV at the time and I converted the bus, I think 15, 16, 17 hours a day. I was just always out there working. And then our daughter was born after we already were living in the school bus. Um, so yeah, I didn't have to do any conversions where there's a newborn. Now, when Juno was born, I, I renovated certain aspects of the bus and changed a few things, but it wasn't like big, big projects. Right. Right. Very cool. Very cool. So tell me about how, how did you get involved in music in the first place? Um, I was me and my roommate, actually, I was a music teacher first and then me and my roommate went to this bar downtown uh that da that had live music and he's like oh we're gonna play music today we're gonna play with that band and i'm like what are you talking about how are we gonna do that and long story short the really quick version is he he's he was a rapper and he rapped on stage blew everybody away everyone was freaking out and they said come back every week we want you to rap with us and so he did that and i kept coming out and then there was an open mic about a month later I played a few songs. Nobody knew that I played. And so they were like, wow. And this one guy came up to me, Daniel B. Marshall from Tampa, Florida. He said, do you want, can you, can you play a four hour cover set? And I said, absolutely. Even though I had no idea. No, I did not know four hour cover music, but I went home and I learned and I covered one of his gigs. And then from that, within a couple of months of doing just maybe two shows a week or so, it turned out to be a full time, six days a week thing and then emily was working at cracker barrel at the time and uh we were just friends and i said hey what would it take for you to you know what do you make at cracker barrel i'll pay you that if you'd come join me and she told me what she made and i'm like the tips alone covered what she made so uh i was like let's do it so that's kind of the beginning of it and then yeah so we did the bar the cover bar beach bar gig in tampa florida started playing at disney about maybe a year and a half, two years later, um, did that for about four years, every Monday and Wednesday. Then we got picked up by the college market. Um, and that's when we started doing more original music stuff. So we traveled into that. And then when we had our son, we started doing um, house concerts. And now pretty much our main set is original music with maybe one or two covers. Um, and so we did live music shows, one hour shows instead of four hour cover gigs. And that's kind of like the short end of our music history. Yeah. So while you were doing the, the shows of just covers, were you still writing your own material at that time? I was, yeah. So I've been writing songs forever, but never really, we never recorded them or did anything with them. Uh, I started incorporating them into our cover gigs um, just to kind of like try them out. And then when people, especially the songs that me and Emily wrote together, when people started like really liking them and, and stuff and we recorded when we recorded our first song and released it, people started asking for it at all of our shows. And I'm like, what is this new feeling? And then, um, yeah. So then for that whole year, we just started going to Nashville uh, one weekend every month to record one song. And within nine months, we had a nine song e uh, CD and we released that and have been recording and writing music ever since. That's cool. So what, what is that process like? for you like how how does that creative process work for you i mean how does a song come to you is it is it a quick process is it something you wake up in the middle of the night with a song in your head a melody in your head and you start writing it down or just how does that work for you i'm actually glad that you said that because i forgot a few days ago i actually had a dream where i was singing this song that i wrote and then i woke up in the middle of the night and like i was so tired but i got out of my bed and grabbed my guitar and my voice memo and i recorded it real quick and then went back to bed and I still haven't listened back to it and see if it was good or not. But I remembered it being great, really great that I remember it anyway. Um, but normally I'll just pull out my guitar and just kind of mess around. Uh, and then I really like like a riff or like a vibe of something. And then a melody will come right away. Lyrics are always last for me personally. Um, and so that's kind of my process. I, I would say 90% of my songs, though, have been written while I'm at a concert playing because and while emily's talking i'll fiddle around while she's talking in the background and then i'll actually record it on my phone while she's talking at the show and i'll tell everybody 
I think I'm going to use that. And yeah, 90% of my songs have come from that. Um, sometimes Emily, Emily will write like two songs a year. That's it by herself. And those will be our biggest songs always like Arcadian and Rome were Emily, you know, and that was like her just one song a year. And I would write like a billion in a month and, you know, maybe three of them will make it on an album. But usually our favorite way of doing it is to sit down together and start from scratch and just, all right, what are we feeling? What do we want to write about? And then I'll try to come up. We'll, we'll think of different songs that we like and like, I want to go with this kind of vibe. And then I'll try to write something on the guitar that sounds good. And then within half an hour, we have a song and that's usually how it works. Yeah. I love that. That, that collaboration, I think that's pretty special that you can, sit down and and do that together and come up with some some beautiful music that you guys have created for sure so uh, but so i know you just said emily had uh had written rome and again I, I mentioned in the intro that that's really how i connected with you guys because i mean again for anyone that's out there traveling living this nomad lifestyle like that that song says you know probably what all of us are feeling so when you know when she kind of when she wrote that and then kind of threw it by you what you know what was your initial reaction to that song um i she actually was like i don't think i like this i think it may be kind of too cheesy and i remember telling her i liked it right away i'm like yes i'm in count me in i like it and then i think that night or like two days later we had a show and we played it and i think when it really hit home for us is we were playing at a um, the bus fair it's an event in oregon and um we, yeah we played that song and then all these nomads were like tearing up and like and it was just in a really emotional moment and i'm like well that's it that's <laughs> This is the no this is the song and now it's our I would I Utah is still technically I think our biggest song but it is the one that gets requested the most I think live yeah yeah I think you definitely hit the uh hit the spot with the nomad community for sure because like I said when I when I first heard it it was just like yeah this is uh this this can be a theme song for for many for sure so yeah you you've talked about how you uh you've you've done these i guess residencies for lack of a better term at, at disney um you're currently doing one um at silver dollar city in branson um yep. and and you also kind of you know have done the you know going from place to place you know truly touring type of uh of performing which which do you like better um, traveling from city to city and, and performing to different people, you know, every night or, you know, having that kind of comfort of being on the same stage, knowing the sound system, kind of knowing how it's all going to happen like you are during a residency. Well, so they both have their benefits um, and the, and their cons, you know. So for me, uh, we always I would say we usually when even when we travel, we carry our own sound system with us. So we our sound is very consistent assistant so i'm grateful for that um oh man i don't know so when we travel we only play one hour shows usually three four days a week and they're house concerts with new people new living rooms and they all sit around in like a theater type setting and uh they listen to us tell our stories and they're there to see us you know and so uh a lot of them usually know our music and they sing our songs and they request our songs and then we sell our merch and it's just a great night really quick in and out and then we travel and explore. That's the best part. Um, Silver Dollar City, they're not there necessarily. I mean, a lot of people go for the music, um, but we just happen to be one of the music acts there. And right. So it's, but I love it there too, though, because it's still a theater setting where they sit and they, they listen. And we play mostly original. Uh, well, I'd say maybe 50 50. I don't know, depending on the set, because we we never have a set list. It's always on the fly. We let the crowd decide if they know our music. And usually there's somebody in the crowd that knows our music in each set. But we do four half an hour sets throughout the day. So it's a little bit more than we play, but it's super fun. Uh, I don't know. It's I don't even think there's a honestly, I don't think there's a con in either one on my behalf. But I'm also one of those like the world is so great kind of a personality i guess but 
Uh, I love traveling because I love seeing new places. I love being on the road. I love getting behind my, you know, the driver's seat and just driving our giant school bus all over the country and giving tours at random gas stations and meeting different people. But I love the fact that we I'm on 7.3 acres of property that we own, um, that we're building and, and making pathways and putting string lights all over trees. And I have nomad friends parked here with me today. And uh, going to the theme park and having that same set up every day and new crowds every set, you know? So we're, yeah, I don't know which one I like better at this. I like them all. Well, that that's always a good position to be in when, uh, when you like them all. And, and I'm sure for you, it's just getting out there and interacting with the crowd is just the best part of it, regardless of where it's at for sure. Oh, it's so fun and letting them know that we're, we don't take ourselves too seriously at these shows. And uh, there could be a stress like, OK, this is America's number one theme park in the country right now. And we really want to be, you know, but uh, Silver Dollar City's kind of adopted us as their um, we're going to be more uh, technically employees of the park full time. And when you do that, normally we'll still travel five to six months a year. But when you become like a resident there you don't you're there for the long haul until you quit or you do something crazy stupid and then they fire you but um yeah that's pretty much the way it is like they people that have worked there have been there 40 you know 30 40 years they just don't leave and there's a reason for that um, yeah. it's a great company so yeah i was telling emily the other day i'm like i can't wait to go play and go to the park and go to work. And I also can't wait to get back home and work on our property and have campfires with my friends. Like both, I'm just just as excited for both things. And I'm so grateful that I'm like, oh, I don't have to go to work today. I, I really don't feel that. Like, I can't wait to go and play for these people. And uh, yeah. So tell me a little bit about just, you know, kind of the, the high that you get performing in front of a crowd. I mean, I, I tell people all the time, I'm the furthest thing from a, from a musician. I played bass badly when I was in high school. Uh, I haven't <laughs> ended, ended up giving it to my nephew. Who's a great guitar player and can pick up anything with a string on it and, and make it sound great. Um, I'll dabble with the harmonica occasionally. And one time we were doing a fundraiser for our organization and uh, a couple of my players were in a band and they convinced me to get up on stage and play harmonica with them. And, very reluctantly, I went up and did it, uh, but that feeling I got playing in front of a crowd was like no other high that I had ever experienced in my life. So, you know, tell me yeah. what that's like for you, because, you know, you went from being a music teacher to, again, sounds like you kind of reluctantly went into performing live, but how quickly were you hooked on on that feeling of performing live? Well, I was uh, doing like open mics here and there, um, like when I was in Canada, but I've always, I was never reluctant. I always wanted to perform. That was, I honestly didn't enjoy teaching. Um, I think, I think I enjoy teaching people that really want to learn. Um, but for the most part, I was teaching, you know, kids that parents just wanted them to take lessons, but the kids weren't really interested. And so it was just kind of miserable. Um, but I, yeah, since that very first gig, I mean, where I did my first cover gig and I got a check from playing music. Because, you know, the, 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 when you play at open mics, you don't make anything. You just go and you play songs. But when I got, I think it was uh, $200 for playing for four hours, I was like, what is this? You know, <laughs> and I was so broke, so poor. Uh, so I, I loved it. I was so stoked. And now you know, we're in a position where I've, I've never made this much money before. And I'm just, I'm so grateful, but uh, yeah, there was never any reluctancy. It, it was from day one. It was like, this is what I was made to do kind of a thing. Yeah. So, so you, you felt that energy instantly that that's, that's what you wanted to do. Oh, totally. And I remember for the first couple of years, it really wasn't listening environments. It was always background music while people ate. And I know a lot of musicians struggle with that, but I, I don't know. I just, I could play John Mayer, Coldplay and Beatles tunes all night long while people are eating and I'm just jamming and playing whether they're listening or not. I had no problem with that. Even to this day, even now we play in front of listening audiences, but uh, I had no problem doing that. It was fun. That's cool. So you kind of uh, let the bat, let the cat out of the bag a few minutes ago and you talked about, you now have property. 
uh, in Arkansas. Yep. So tell me a little bit about how that came about. Um, and it, it certainly doesn't sound like you're hanging up the nomad lifestyle a hundred percent by any means, but you now will have a spot that you, you'll be able to kind of go and anchor down in it at certain times of the year. So how, how did that come about? So I guess um, it's been a dream for the past, like I think two years to like own something. Um, sorry, one second. I'm going to tell my kids to play a little quieter. <laughs> no problem. Again, the, the beauty of uh, an authentic podcast is we have some background noise and kids doing their thing while Shane's doing the dad thing. Oh, yeah. And it's the joy. It's so great. <laughs> uh, so I we've always we we just drive all over the country and be like, what if this is where we live? What if this is where we live? And I think when you live the nomadic lifestyle, I find it's just a natural progression that once you travel for a few years, everyone's looking. I don't even. I don't know what it is, but everyone's looking for property, you know, that you could park your rig at. And I think a lot of that um, comes from the desire to be able to park your place where someone can't knock on your door and say you have to leave. Or even when you park in an RV park or, you know, there's always rules and what you can and what you can't do. And when you're parking at a friend's house, there's always this thing in the back of your mind. Are we overstaying our welcome? You know, all those kind of things. But when it's your property, you can do what you want. And with us building our aim frame, uh, we're going to be going throughout the property and clearing out pathways and having lights dangle through all the pathways and having little campsites set up for people to come and stay. Um, and I think that's a lot of people's desire, too, is to have something where people can go and, uh, you know, host their friends that are traveling. And so anyway, that's kind of like the start of it. But then when Silver Dollar City said, hey, we want you here more full time, uh, but you could still travel. And if there's a really great you know, festival or show you want to do, just let us know and we'll find a cover. And they're just super flexible with what we want to do. And the park, the park closes um, uh, January and February anyway. So we're able to go to events like Schooly Palooza because um, that's two months where nothing is happening here anyway. So we, and it's the coldest month. So it's just nice to go to Arizona, Florida, wherever we want to go. And then there are some festivals here that just, we're not bluegrass. We're not gospel um, and uh, things like that. So there's a certain festivals we naturally aren't a part of. Um, so that gives us, you know, now during this festival, we could do a mid Midwest run. And then over here, we could do a Southeast. And then over here uh, during these dates, we can do, um, I can go to Canada and the Northeast. And so we're still able to hit our markets. Um, but if we're going to be in one place for six months, I don't want it to be at an RV park. I want it to be in something that we're building, creating. And, you know, we follow the Dave Ramsey thing too. And there's just something about, first of all, being debt free, but also putting your money into something that's growing, uh, you know, your net worth or your, your assets, you know, I'd rather put my money towards something that's growing, but also something that people can come to and just like, you know, find peace and joy by staying on our property and, yeah. Yeah. I, I hope that, that answers that question. <laughs> yeah. No, definitely, definitely does. I, I love it. Um, what, you know, for, for Sandy and I, one of the things we've found so amazing about this nomad lifestyle is the community itself. And I know a lot of times when I talk to people who don't live the lifestyle, they don't understand how you can live on the road and still be part of a community. Um, obviously, you guys understand that. You mentioned earlier that you've actually got, a handful of friends staying on your property with you guys right now. But what, you know, what was that experience like for you? Just, you know, seeing how this nomad community embraces you and just is so different than the rest of society, in my opinion. Well, okay. So there's a few things. I think there's something to be said about uh, when there's so many different walks of life, like this person uh, even religiously believes this, or this person doesn't have any beliefs of that kind over here. And this guy's an engineer, but this person over here is an artist and so many different walks of life that you normally wouldn't like be super close friends with just because of, I don't know, just differences in the way people live, but there's something about, Oh my gosh, you you travel full time and live in your rig. I do too. And there's something about that living nomadically. There's, we all share the same struggles and the same joys in this lifestyle. Everybody says the same thing. Like, this is my struggle. This is what I love about it. 
I've never seen anybody that had a different answer. It was always the same thing, like the sights, the sounds, new places. My backyard is different every, you know, every morning uh, I wake up in a new spot or those are, those are all the great things. Uh, breakdowns, um, getting that knock at 2 a.m. saying you can't park here. Like we all have the same. We share something super common that most people don't understand. Um, and so because there is that there's the community is just super strong because you go to these events like schooly palooza van life events and things like that but you're you walk up to someone's campfire and there's never any like should i come up should i do this or should i not no a hundred percent walk up to people's campfires say hi knock on people's bus and say hey can i see your rig everybody that's what people want to do like nobody is like that so um yeah that's the great thing. And then there are so many events like Schooly Palooza, Van Fest, Tiny House Festivals, where nomads get together um, and you see your same friends all over in different parts of the country quite consistently. My kids see a lot of the same people and usually um, people will get together um, and travel together and like kind of what we're doing. We have uh, four other, you know, van lifers, uh, Airstream uh schoolies on our property right now or you know one guy's been following us since schooly palooza you know so it's just so cool actually two people two people have been following us since schooly palooza that's very cool so. it's very cool yeah we're we're actually taking a trip uh this summer through canada and up into alaska and we're doing it with a group of uh four other full-time friends and that that's the coolest part about what we're looking forward to there is just doing it as a group, as opposed to just the two of us, um, taking on that adventure ourselves. So, you know, to, to be able to travel like a group, like you guys are, and being able to get together with your friends is certainly a blessing for you for sure. Yeah, definitely. We want to go to Alaska so bad with some friends. Um, but man, uh, we've had so many breakdowns the past couple of days. I'm just so nervous about even thinking about doing that but you know i'm i'm gonna do it um eventually yeah, it's that, in our plan that's one of the things you talk about the nomad lifestyle you know dealing with those things i mean yesterday we were actually sitting in a lazy days rv repair shop getting our generator fixed because we were having issues with our generator and you know this morning we're actually in a, a harvest host in texas which is actually a laundromat as a harvest host so we're gonna <laughs> You know, hang out here, hang out here, record a couple podcasts in the parking lot and do our laundry throughout the day. But again, those are just the cool things of, you know, living this lifestyle. Um, you know, you, you deal with the breakdowns and, you know, they are what they are. Um, and you just uh, you just keep putting one one foot in front of the other and, and moving forward. But, you know, the ability to wake up in different spots every day is just so, so incredible for sure. Yeah, I love, man, Harvest Host was one of my favorite things to do. I loved Harvest Host. Um, like staying at different farms and wineries and uh, like kind of experiencing the, the area and the culture around there by doing that. Is that better? Yeah. So oh, wow. is, that, is that one of your uh, one of your plans to turn your property into like a Harvest Host or are you going to do it more of a kind of traditional type of smaller campground? <laughs> Oh my goodness. I didn't even I didn't even think of that. There you go, Juno. You got your band-aids? Look at you got some band-aids. There you go. That's that's multitasking right there. Putting uh putting band-aids on the daughter while doing a podcast. And making dinner. I mean lunch. <laughs> Woo-hoo. Don't worry, mommy. When mommy gets back, she'll make it feel so good. Mommy knows how to make those things feel good. Don't worry, Daddy's gonna make some mac and cheese, and it's gonna taste so yummy. It still feels weird after all this time. Oh, good. I'm glad. <laughs> um, yeah. But oh, yeah, I never even thought harvest host on my property. Like, what a great idea! <laughs> You're <Yeah>. welcome. <laughs> I'm totally gonna do that. Um, I yeah, never even crossed my mind um people can come I, in buy it buy a copy of a cd or you know merchandise and stuff like that and you're you're ready to roll totally be like do you guys need some travel music excellent 
Well, if you do that, we will definitely be a, a harvest hoster at your spot at some time in the future for sure. Brilliant. Yes. And then we'll like do like a thing like, oh, it's like an activity. Help us cut down trees when really we're just trying to get like free labor. <laughs> there you go. We've got some other friends of ours who are doing a similar thing where they're turning uh, a property that they just bought um, in uh, Tennessee into like a, an adventure camp where they're building some A-frame cabins and stuff like that. So um, there's so many possibilities if you, you know, if you have the ingenuity and, and uh, you know, wherewithal to, to kind of put it together. So I, I love that, uh, you know, what you guys are doing isn't just about a spot for you, but also creating a spot for others. That's, uh, that's pretty cool for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited. I think we're going to create something really cool here. Let me kiss it. Okay. Here you go. So, this will better. So Shane, is there, we've talked about a you know bunch of different topics across the board here, but is there anything that we missed that you think would be important for our uh, listeners before we wrap things up? Oh man, not that I can think of. I mean, we definitely have, you know, like social medias and, and we post blogs. I mean, there's those kind of things. Um, it's cold. Mm, well, that's supposed to be cold. Um, but yeah, I can't, can't think of anything else except, yeah. I It's funny, like people are saying like, do you think everyone should do this? That's one of the questions that people that I ask and I'm like, I don't know. I feel like everybody should travel maybe, but I don't think anything is for everybody, you know? I agree. And so, I agree. yeah, I mean, we, even in Rome, our song Rome, just to kind of tie this up, you know, since that's what we started talking about was that song where like, um, what, what is it? Emily says, it's funny. We sing a song every time we play a show one second, maybe. Um, but I don't remember. What is it? Uh, I've got nothing against that white picket fence or those big American dreams. Cause you know, they're great things for, for people, you know, and right. it just wasn't for us, you know? Right. And um, yeah. Yeah. We just, we love the experiences. Overthink. Oh, that's some good Mac and cheese right there. <laughs> yeah. That's, um, uh, that, that's, that, that's a great point though. It's not, it's not a lifestyle for everybody. And I think that's one of the things that sadly our society has, you know, kind of tried to push is that there's this one size fits all, um, method for everybody, you know, go, you know, go to a four year school, you know, put yourself in, in debt, work the rest of your life to pay for it, all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. you know, and those of us who know, it's just not, you know, Hey, if that's the route you want to go, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, my message is always like discover what, what is your path? What is your path to happiness? Whether it's living in an RV full-time, a schoolie, um, you know, playing music, find your own path. Cause they're not all the same for all of us. God, God gave us all free will for a reason. Yeah, that's right. And there's just so many ways to bring joy and life into people's lives and all that kind of stuff. And you don't, I mean, there, I love how, I don't know if people are Bible readers and on this podcast or whatever, but for me, the Bible is super not clear or not, not, not clear. Sorry. It is not, it doesn't give you like a, this is how you, you know, this is what your job should be. This is what your, you know, your life should look like. It's really just, I feel like there's so many ways to bring, uh, joy to people and to love people and to serve people no matter what it is you do for a living, no matter what kind of lifestyle you choose. And um, I think there's a lot to say about like just that freedom, just whatever it is you're doing, just make sure you're loving people and you're helping people. And, uh, you know, I think about like all the different places that I visit and travel and gas stations and, and restaurants and where we're buying groceries, like are like smiling at people. And when someone bumps into you and the way you say you're, Oh, I'm so sorry. You know, like, I don't know just random little things help at, I don't know, you know, it's just those really small things that you don't think about that make really big impacts on people. And when we do shows, I try to smile a lot. And after the show, talk to people and, and uh, I just, I'm not that band that we're not that band that we're just like too cool for school in the middle of songs. It's just like, thanks. Here's right. my next song. Right. Trying to have the cool persona. If, that works for you and that's your thingy or that's your personality you know all the power to you but i think for me personally there is this whole like 
I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a human. You're a human. We're, you know, we're in this together. I don't, I don't know what you're going through in your day to day life. Um, I just hope that when you, when you come watch our shows that you're just, that you feel like we're, we're giving back to you and, and trying to make you just your day a little bit better by you just sitting here listening to us. And uh, we're just grateful that you could be anywhere, but you're sitting here with us right now. And that's kind of, you know, how I feel at our shows and our music. And yeah, there's just so many ways to give back and there's so many ways to be a blessing to other people. And um, yeah, it's in the small things as well as the big things. I'm kind of ranting at this point or, <laughs> or babbling, but no, that's fine. It's all good stuff. So, um, Shane, where do people find you guys if they want if they want your music, if they want to see where you're touring at, if they want to reach out and connect to you, where do they find you on the internet? Uh, so Instagram's my favorite. TikTok, not my favorite. Don't know what the heck I'm doing on that. But yeah, Instagram is my all-time favorite. Facebook, of course. Um, Patreon is ways that you can support us monthly, whether it's two bucks a month or a hundred bucks a month or whatever. And there's different perks and fun things. Like we release songs there that nobody hears. We um we your name goes on the side of our bus we send postcards depending on your tier just fun things like that so patreon's great uh our website um you can get our music and merch and things like that um and see where we're playing so yeah that's pretty much it that's cool what's the uh what's the website address for you guys it is arborseason.com and uh, arbor spell with the u because i'm canadian so a r b o u r got it so shane that brings us to our final question and you kind of answered it uh during your little rant there that you said you were going through but we'll uh we'll give you an opportunity here to kind of wrap it up um you know a little bit uh in a nice little package here but as you know the subtitle podcast is many little people in many little places and it comes from the opening lyrics of the michael fronte song gloria which go when many little people in many little places do many little things and the whole world changes. So it's one of the little things that Shane does on a daily basis to make the world a little bit better place. Um, so something I think about consistently is everyone who's around me, uh, whether it's my kids or my wife or my friends that are parked here or the people that I run into at the theme park or come to our shows. Am I, uh, is it about me or is it about them? And I'm consistently trying to think like, these are people around me that have to be around me for whatever purpose. And, then, and, and do they leave feeling better or do they leave feeling worse? And so sometimes that's just smiling a lot or, or like really listening to what they're saying when they're talking to you or giving them attention, like trying to give you attention while we're doing this podcast, but also not getting mad at my kids for just being kids and having fun, right. you know, like all those small things, like speaking of which, sorry, that probably does not feel good on the cat. Let's not do that. <laughs> you know just that i mean that's pretty much it like serving people helping and uh just i think just being positive you know i think is is really good um at least that's what i try to do anyway yeah no i love it it's a great answer shane i really appreciate you taking out the time here doing double duty with uh dad time and podcast time i really appreciate it uh for folks out there listening be sure to check out my other podcasts and blogs at journeymymotherson.com while you're there pick up a copy of one of my books shane again i really appreciate the time i wish you the best in this new venture here with the the property and if you turn it into harvest host i guarantee you that sandy and i will uh, we'll see you there someday Woohoo! i love it thanks a lot thank you <laughs>